Hello. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, I, we had a sound check for the mics, but I don't think we had a sound check for the room yet. <laughs> Please do feel free to come in and sit down. The, the first row here will just get edified, actually. Um, uh, I am Sumana Hariharishwara. I am the engineering community manager for the Wikimedia Foundation, been in open source for uh, about a decade. And uh, I am very much uh, appreciating the opportunity that Kelly suggested to co-present with me. Uh, the title is, Don't Lick the Cookie, an open discussion about organizational dysfunctions. Kelly? Sure, uh, my name is Kelly Barnell. I work at a small firm, actually I'm starting on Monday, called Giant Rabbit, and we do CRM implementations for nonprofits. I actually also want to mention, um, the history of this particular subject, uh, when Sumina was visiting a friend of ours named Seth in San Francisco, it was super late at night and Sumina was very, very jet lagged. And the first thing that I heard her start talking about was licking the cookie, bike shedding, and yak shaving. And she told it with such panache that I thought it would be really fun to invite a much larger group of people into the discussion about the kinds of crazy behaviors that we observe in open source. Um, so this is sort of the follow-up from our initial meeting. Next slide. Next slide. See if it... I mean, I guess we could just stick on this. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's a good slide, but I don't know if it's an hour and 45 minutes slide. <laughs> it's true. We have a long way to go. Kelly, why don't you talk a little bit about what our goal is in this hour and 45 minute in service? Whew. Yeah. So, um, the way that I think about it, and please also feel free to jump in at any time. I think if nobody spoke for the next hour and 45 minutes, we would really be very unhappy at the end of it. And well, instead, we are in a church. We could just consider it meditation. No, I don't right, think okay, that's fine. the right way oh. to go with this particular subject. All right, that's fine then. <laughs> but um, so I think many of us, oops, we should stand away from the mic, or from the speaker. Um, many of us who participate in open source projects or really any kind of volunteer project for long enough um, end up facing tremendous frustrations with how people are behaving. And often we want to describe it as um, sort of obstructionist or um, we're not quite sure what their reasoning is. And um, But on the other side of the spectrum, um, it's often hard to kind of reconnect with the reasons why we got involved in these communities in the first place. And most of the time, it's because they're doing something really important and something that you value deeply in your life and for your community. And so the goal of this session is to try to help you get through those frustrations in order to continue contributing, um, or if that's not going to be possible, to leave and um, find a, a sort of better community for you to do that. I think that a lot of the things we're talking about are applicable to families, co-ops, open source projects, jobs, uh, sometimes other forms of community that I might not be as familiar with. Um, but it's so important to, A, understand what it is that's actually frustrating you, and B, feel like you are at least partly in control of your response to it. Like, right, the, the serenity prayer uh, is, you know, God grant me the courage to change what I can, right? The serenity to leave alone what I can't, and the wisdom to know the difference, right? So we're in a church, you know, we gotta, yeah. All right, next, next slide. Um, actually, while we're still on goals to get, get your vocal cords working, because we're going to need them later on, does anyone have any other goals or any other sort of, this is why I showed up today, I want to be sure you cover this material, or I want to be sure we have a chance to talk about this? Yes. Uh, go ahead, uh, Heidi. Okay. I'll just repeat that. Um, uh, Heidi said that I, she wants to stop walking ignorantly and unknowingly into trouble, troubled organizations and be able to spot those dysfunctions uh, before walking in. Yes? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Any others? Yeah. Go ahead, Josh. Um, it's so that at least, you know, for me, since we're growing an organization, it's so that in the future, whatever we discuss here, we will not repeat those mistakes. Uh, no, you should do it. All right, Josh said, uh, you know, as you're growing an organization, try not to repeat the same mistakes that we've already like seen and discussed in this group. I, I figure, you know, growth is about making new novel mistakes, right? <laughs> Indeed. In fact, uh, one of the favorite signs in the Wikimedia offices, which I printed out for myself, is let's make better mistakes tomorrow <laughs> with a little hype period. And I yeah. thought that was a good attitude to have. Go ahead, Denise. Yeah. So that it's 
not always my problem to mediate it. Uh, she uh, is, uh, okay, this is a big expectation. She would like, you know, tools, approaches she could teach to other people so they can learn to manage and deal with dysfunction so she's not the only one. You know, there's a bus factor, huh, in your project where, like, are you the social sysadmin? Yes. <laughs> like, there's sysadmins who deal with the digital infrastructure, but sometimes there's only one person yeah. who knows how to fix the social infrastructure when it goes wrong. So, uh, I think you had something? Oh, okay, amen. Cool. Got it. We got it. This is what we have instead of a like button here, I guess. Go ahead. Um, I, I have the situation where the person who is designated as a manager is, is the person that's not wanting to manage. So I think trying to communicate when there, when there is a role of, of management on somebody that isn't really uh, doing that job. And we, I mean, we have exactly the situation where they keep on taking the tasks and I can't then take them. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's stuck. What, what, what's your name, if you don't mind me asking? Kalina. Hello, Kalina. I'm Sumana. Good to meet you. Um, the, the situation, if you don't mind me repeating it, is what if you have someone who's designated as a manager, but who seems not to like actually accomplish the tasks, but <laughs> keeps taking them and then not delegating them, not allowing other people to do it. So you have that specific situation. This leads nicely into your discussion, possibly, of what the structure of today is going to yeah. be. Please come sit. So uh, in trying to figure out sort of how to uh, structure this conversation, we thought it would be helpful to explore sort of different components of a problem that you might be facing in your individual communities, um, provide you with some language for explaining that to other people to hopefully help reduce the burden of it being on you, to help um, sort of uh, call out that kind of behavior in your own mind so you can identify what communities might be exhibiting it before you join them. Um, and then the final part of the... Um, session today will be to discuss in smaller groups, so we'll break you up into probably four to six, and you can talk specifically about a, a, something that you might be experiencing today or you might have experienced in the past and never really worked through with the same kind of tools that we're hopefully going to go over today. So I have like one or two bits of housekeeping I just came up with, which I'm going to spring on you. Go for it. Um, one is, I understand this is a longer session, so if people need to take a bio break, uh, in the middle at some point. Like, I personally won't take offense if you need to, to get up, and even if you need to not come back. Um, and uh, the second thing is, because we're going to be engaging in these discussions where people are going to be talking about real problems they're facing, I would ask that if people say, you know what, I'm having this problem, but I kind of don't want to talk about it in public, mm -hmm. please do keep that confidence. Because, I mean, it's not like any of us here are qualified <laughs> therapists that I know of, but, you know, we want to actually be able to have those real discussions. People need to be vulnerable, which means they sometimes need to say, something that you would have to, to keep that secret. If you're not comfortable with that, you might want to move to another group and say, well, actually, I'm not comfortable keeping your confidence. And that's okay, mm -hmm. you know, because some of us, you know, are in situations where we don't want to be the keepers of other people's confidences, and that's also okay. Yeah, and just to add on that, I think during the discussion period, we'll probably turn off the mics. So yeah. you're not being recorded right. in the world to see. And we probably should have told the AV people that at the beginning. We probably should have. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, and then, They're all named Mike. <laughs> not true. all. Mike. Okay. Um, and then uh, we've left a little time at the end of the discussion if um, people would be able to report back any insights or any solutions that you came up with that you felt might be helpful for the rest of the group. Is that reasonably intelligible to people? Do, do we have any, any questions, any concerns? Rock. Excellent. Okay. So let's talk about some tools that the more experienced social sysadmins use to diagnose problems. And unfortunately, there's nothing as quick as just like, you know, diagnose.py or something like that. But, um, you know, we have some distinctions and categorizations that we use that sometimes are useful to us that... Um, oh, up a slide. Yeah. I don't know where oh, I'm at. It's all right. So um, basically, as you face more and more of these situations and actually think about them with some of these lenses, you'll be able to faster and faster be like, oh, I see, this is a such and such kind of problem, just as you would with any other problem in your working life. Yep. So we'd, we thought we'd start out sort of at uh, the moment at which you start feeling frustration, however you feel it, um, and the kind of moment when you discover, oh, I think I have a problem here, and we thought it was uh, when I can no longer do my work. This is a really standard thing, as I understand it, in, in general, in diagnosing, like, I have a problem in my life, is because you realize you have, you know, a frustrated desire. There's a thing you want, there's a thing you see your community wanting, and you're blocked. 
You know, this is one of those standard three scrum questions or agile questions, right, that you get asked in the stand-up every day. It's like, what did I do yesterday? What do I aim to do today? What is blocking me? And when you realize that it's actually the same thing blocking you, you know, multiple days in a row, the same thing blocking your group multiple days in a row, mm -hmm. um, and getting into the habit of asking yourself that question, whether or not you have, like, a scrum master to, <laughs> to ask you, you know, is, is a useful thing, because then that will help you diagnose frustration and help you understand things. Yeah. I thought it might also be helpful to point out that initially we had two. Um, we had put, I can't do my work, and other people aren't doing their work. And we actually thought we'd focus on this one, <laughs> uh, because the other one may cause more frustrations for other people. So. <laughs> OK. OK, great. And now we can get into the, now we'll start looking at the frameworks. No, no, you should go. All right. So. Um, here, are, you, you may have heard about the distinction between important and urgent. You know, urgent needs to be fixed now. Important, this is a, a long-term substantive thing. And sometimes things are important but not urgent, urgent but not important, et cetera, et cetera. So some examples of problems you might be running into or I've run into in my community or you've run into in your community. I'll just, I'll start with the important one and you might start sure. with the urgent one. Mm -hmm. So um, if you have a shy contributor you know, you might, uh, there might be s people in your, in your community, or maybe you are that shy contributor, who want to contribute to an open source project, but they feel uncomfortable discussing their work in public fora. And there's a lot of people who, especially at the beginning, right, it's such a strange thing that the norm in our community is that you walk into an IRC channel that has like 300 people in it, and you just start shouting. You just start saying things. You don't say hi. You don't say how are you. You, you know, like in, in a lot of times, you don't even like take the temperature of the room in any way by like listening to what, uh, although you might. Like the norm is, oh, don't say hi. That's rude to say hi. That's such a weird thing. So there's people who have trouble with that. They're a bit shy. And making mistakes in public where everyone can see, to a lot of people, that's like strange. Um, what that means is that the progress of the organization is blocked and their progress is blocked. So if you have a problem where the, the on-ramp is completely missing because people are shy and, and they aren't comfortable discussing their work in public, like that's an important problem. But on, at any given moment, it's probably not very urgent. Mm -hmm. And just as a, a con uh, an example of urgent, we heard a story from somebody who said they were working on a project before the days of Git. Um, when version control really couldn't be so easily forked and, um, some, and merged and merged and somebody on their team um, had this really really brilliant idea and it seemed like people agreed that it was a brilliant idea but it would mean that it would block progress for the entire rest of the team and uh, they thought okay great this looks like it'll only take a week I'll be sure to finish it up by then and it turns out at the end of the week it was going to take another week and another few months and eventually the project fell apart because nobody else was able to do their work while this person well, this was. Well, this giant re-architecture was happening in trunk. Yes. <laughs> with no end in sight. Yeah. Come on in, there's seats over here. Uh, so that's an example of a, pro a problem that's urgent, and it was because um, it was never addressed, um, or it wasn't addressed quickly enough, the community fell apart. Okay, so other things that you might want to consider when thinking about, wait, did we skip? Oh, no, we didn't, it's the next one. Okay, so other things you might want to, um, think about when trying to understand what is the nature of my problem or my frustration. And um, we thought it might be helpful to kind of go over at least four different ways that your community might differ from other communities. And those are, um, uh, let's see, the structure. Do you have sort of already um, tools to collaborate? Do you have no tools? Do you have just an IRC channel and a forum, um, or are there lots of sort of procedures and well-explained sort of ways that you can contribute? Um, do you meet, the second one is, do you meet face-to-face -face or are you all distributed? So are, is there no opportunity, is there no conference in which you might have an interpersonal conflict where you can work it out with a mediator or with a facilitator in person? Um, these are things that are going to affect, depending on what your community looks like, what kind of solutions are available to you, um, and probably also the nature of the problem. Decision-making. Um, is it hierarchical? Is there ultimately some one person who has the final say? Um, and if that's the case, maybe you're going to have to try to win them over. Um, if there's not that person and it's all sort of, um, gosh, now I'm totally blanking on consensus the word. Consensus-based? Thank you, yes, consensus-based. Um, you're going to have to operate with a lot of different um, uh, sort of strategies for trying to talk to multiple people um, and figure out how you can uh, get them to agree. 
uh, in a way that doesn't rely, like I said, on having one person just flip their decision. Uh, and then the last one is norms. So if you're um, going to try to, or if you feel like your problem requires the community to change a norm in some way, if there is no acceptance yet of the idea that your culture has norms, um, or if there's no sort of well-articulated um, statement or policy about that, you're probably going to have to have um, a longer on-ramp before you can start having those kinds of conversations. I guess now would be a good time to ask for questions. Yeah, does anyone have questions or other things that you're like, well, I kind of disagree with that, or I have another one to add that might be good to consider? And you'll probably come up with more during the discussions, I imagine, as you think about specific issues. Uh, yeah. Yes, go ahead, Alida. Can you talk more? When, when you say people, what do you mean? Mind if I summarize that, Alida? Sure. Um, so all of these factors are definitely like intersecting with or products of you know, it, people, individual people, groups of people, um, and the things that are sort of emergent behaviors of groups of people and individual people. But like really fundamentally, people come in with expectations and with you know, certain temperaments, and individual people come with temptations, and sometimes sort of groups and cohorts and populations come in maybe with clashing expectations uh, or unspoken expectations, and that's a lot of what causes frustration, mm -hmm. right? And I'd also say, just to add on that, um, expectations about roles, and I might put that under the category of structure. So if you say, uh, but I was you know, asked to participate under the assumption that I would be a manager, under the assumption that I would be a leader in order to accomplish X, Y, and Z goal. And if that turns out to not be the case, um, that can be very frustrating. This is, this is where Buddhism comes in, right? Like, I mean, if you have zero expectations and zero desire, you'll have zero suffering. I feel like... <laughs> I, that's how I read it in the comic books when I was a kid. Like, basically, I was under the impression that that's like that was the story of Buddha. Is like, well, if you just kind of completely give up on desired expectations, like that's what causes suffering is that friction. So you just reduce it. It's kind of I don't know. Is that agile kind of anyway? Um, and and then I, I went I went downstairs. And I told my mom I'm going to be a Buddhist now because like I read it in a comic book. She's like, okay. And then she like an hour later she tried to call me down for dinner, and I was like, I've given up all desire, including desire for food. And she's like, no, no. you're eating dinner. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so my experience of like, you know, 10 year old type Buddhism did not last very long. Um, is there a hand? Yeah. Oh, go ahead, uh, Randall. One thing that I think is missing there is goals, which is Yeah. So goals, right. Goal. Yeah. That's a very good Certainly. point. Certainly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's definitely a, a, a question. In a sense, it's related to uh, Elliot's expectations thing. So Randall pointed out that the one thing that's missing here is goals. Like, what are your goals? What are the goals of, of your community? Mm. What, uh, what might other people be wanting? Um, this is like when you're writing fiction, right? You're told to start off with like a person and a thing they want and a reason they can't have it. Mm -hmm. Because that's what makes an interesting story, you know? And so I have a feeling we're gonna have a lot of interesting stories during the discussion period because it's all full of people and things they want and reasons they can't have it. Goals is also a really good one to add to the list and I think afterwards I'll probably add it. But um, especially because a lot of times we're dealing with cause-driven communities or people who are coming together because they want to accomplish a very particular goal. At the same time, you have people who are involved for a personal goal um, or a reason why it might um, contribute to their own sort of development and stuff like that. All right. Cool. So I shall go ahead and, and speak yeah, to this. Yeah, spent more time thinking no problem. about this. So uh, there's, uh, there's a sociologist named Alberto Hirschman, and neither of us has actually read his book, Exit Voice and Loyalty. So this is just a complete travesty, 
right, of anything that he said. It's like, it's not, it's worse than like just reading the Malcolm Gladwell version of the book, right? Because I haven't even actually read it. I just read the title and like an abstract on Powell's website, you know. And um, the Wikipedia page. And yes, probably the Wikipedia page. You're welcome, by the way, for yeah. Wikipedia. No. Um, so uh, I guess, I mean, we have an hour and 45 minutes. I'm allowed to say once that we're hiring, right? Sure, go for okay, it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> there we go, I'm done. Um, at, at the Wikimedia Foundation. So basically, if you're in a situation, as, as Hirschman pointed out, where you, know, you are unhappy with an environment you're in, you have three choices. You can change your behavior, which is you, know, you attempt to change yourself to better suit the environment. Um, or you can use voice. You know, you can attempt to change, improve that relationship through communication of your complaint or grievance or proposal of change. Uh, I believe that's from Wikipedia, isn't it? It is. It is, cool. Um, and Citation. Well, you say that, you know, someone else or everyone else should change their behavior. Or you can choose to leave. You can fork. So what's an example of loyalty, Sumina? Um, well, those cards at Safeway? No, okay. Um, <laughs> Not loyalty cards. All right, okay. Um, why, why don't you go ahead? They're trying to lock you into being loyal. Oh. Uh, let's see. What was oh, I, well, we talked about this. Like, okay, so if you're in a project where you think everyone should be innovating faster, like mm -hmm. we, should be, we should be changing our architecture, you know, in response to the latest research, and everyone else is saying something like, well, no, we have a huge legacy base of... Uh, you know, big installs that we need to, uh, you know, it's more important to be backwards compatible. Like, you may decide, well, actually, now I understand I should be changing my behavior. Go ahead, Scott. I have an example. Like, oh, yes, yeah, please, please go ahead. Yay. Why don't you go ahead and come up? I'm sorry, this is wired. Oh. Oh, poor me. I left Google a couple of years ago. Uh, some of you may have heard that. Um, and that was a real... Um, loyalty voice or exit decision because it was around the time they were launching Google Plus and I really didn't like what they were doing. And what they were doing was requiring people to give their legal names and provide government documentation in order to use Google Plus. So my choices were, did I go like, I'm a good Google employee, I'm on board with this, I will buy into it, or would I fight against it within the organisation, which I tried to do for six months, or will I leave, which is what I eventually did. So I sort of went through all three of those <laughs> stages right. very rapidly, but that was my, like, that's the example I always think of when I hear this thing, so that's all. Yeah. Thank you. I, yes. also, I think that is a really good example because for most of us, we probably do try a variety of these. And I know from my past experiences, I'll probably start, with, start out with loyalty and be like, oh man, how can I possibly shift what I'm doing? And then, oh, I'm still not really satisfied or I'm still finding myself frustrated, so how can I explain that to other people? and see if there's a way that they might be able to change their behavior. Um, another example, and then if none of those work, I say, oh, okay, my last option is to exit. Um, Some people, I mean, so if you're in a situation uh, where you've entered an environment that you're not thriving in, because thriving is a function of the fit between a person and their environment. So if you're in an environment that you're not fitting into, you know, you can change yourself, change the environment, or just leave. Mm -hmm. um, or sometimes be fired. The immune system will reject you. <laughs> <laughs> and I have experienced that. Uh, um, and so, uh, yeah, it, it might be that any one of these is right. Like, and I just want to point out that, like, sometimes we have other nicknames for these that are derogatory. Like loyalty. You know what else it is? It's Stockholm Syndrome. You know, it's beginning to identify the captive with their captor, you know? What, what is voice? It's kind of being like that jerky gadfly, you know? Oh, we ought to do this, we ought to do that. Like sometimes if other people don't enjoy the voice or if you don't enjoy someone else's use of voice, you might consider them kind of a, a blowhard bike shedder. Um, and what is exit? Oh, you know, forking needlessly, fragmenting the project, quitter, mm -hmm. you know? You might even call yourself, oh, I, that would make me a quitter. All of these might be legitimate strategies. All of them might be the wrong strategies. And we need to be able to look at that neutrally. Uh, Josh, then Marianne. Um, I'm not sure if this applies for all websites, but I was kind of thinking of a fourth solution, which, may un which probably could be a sub-solution under your idea. Because I know that for, that I'll use Wikipedia as an example, as an example that most of you If you don't agree with the policy change, you just ignore the policy change, <laughs> but like, you isolate yourself from the rest of the community. And that mm. usually happens if I think it happens with some subset of people. Okay, so you're su suggesting sort of a science fictional hybrid animal yeah. of, I think, like, uh, of, of exit voice and loyalty, where you just yeah. sort of like, you sort of fork, sort of, like you're still technically in the larger community, but you sort of create a mm -hmm. small subspace where your rules apply and you ignore a rule you don't like, you ignore people you don't like. Yeah, yeah. I didn't hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry? 
Oh, I thought um, you didn't hear Josh. I misunderstood. Yeah, what? There was a, well, I must have missed that memo. I didn't get that P- GPS report. Um, I think, uh, Marianne? Mm. Taking That's a break. A um, I left a group for 10 years because I was, my life changed. I was frustrated. Um, during that time, they not only solved the issues I was mm. having problems with, but became a much better organization that I love to death. Mm. Let me, uh, if I may uh, just summarize that. You, you know, she left a group, came back 10 years later, it had become a much better group, and they had solved not only the problem that she left basically because of, but it just overall become a much better, and she loves it now. So yeah, exit can be temporary, you know? Mm-hmm. You could you choose to come back. I think there were a couple other hands. <coughs> ah, okay, hi, what's your name? Uh, Skyler. Hi, Skyler. Hi, um, I was actually thinking, uh, one of the words for what you described is autonomy. Autonomy. Thank you. Um, Sure. So if you don't mind if I summarize that. Sure. Uh, so Skylar pointed out that um, in his experience as a uh, designer and idea generator more, more than a developer, um, in larger organizations, you know, you have more autonomy. Uh, that, that's in your experience. And then in smaller groups of like, you know, say six people, like you kind of have, to, because you're kind of having to engage with other people on almost like a more intimate level, like you kind of get caused to do like, you know, you kind of have to choose one of these things. Maybe you have less room to maneuver, mm-hmm. kind of. Yes? All right, so, so the Google example would be, like, if it's not your job, then you have, right. Scott? I realized one that I do is dissociate. Dissociate is, a, is an option. What do you mean by that? You just kind of check out. And mm. So you mentally check out. Mentally check out and emotions robotically. Mm. Just to sort of survive the conflict that's going on. Right, yeah. Can, go ahead. I, yeah, maybe those are sort of, well, I... Yeah, I guess it's kind of like two different kinds of exit, right? In your example, Skylar, in the back, you sort of exited the group that you were a part of and just put a little distance between yourself. Um, and Scud, you're saying you sort of checked out in the sense of like you're still there, but... And you're going through the motions of- robotically, right. And I certainly, I don't want to turn into one of those people who's like, everything must fit in these three buckets or all you will all be judged or something. <laughs> these are just, you know, some ideas to kind of get your brains going, as they already have. Shall we move on to the next thing? Sure. The last thing I want to add is I really like in the examples that have been brought up so far is the idea of organizations changing over time. So Heidi, you brought up the fact that you'd like to be able to know when you start Uh, whether or not it's dysfunctional. And I've definitely seen organizations switch from being totally functional to totally dysfunctional and going the other way around too, um, where all of a sudden the ingredients fall into place like the community that you were a part of, not a part of, and a part of again. Okay, so. All right, this is like, I don't, I don't even know how to explain this. I feel like this is the Jeff Foxworthy part uh, or, or like the Reader's Digest part because it's full of all these little chunks, you know, that people might enjoy because, oh, I finally have a name for that thing. Um, and uh, like bike shedding, yak shaving, and cookie licking are, are the three that, that Kelly was so enamored of. And then we, um, we have some sources at actually in the, at the end of the slide of some places where we got additional names for stuff, including uh, the community management wiki, which I think Scott started. Thank you. Yeah, and then you dissociated from. And then oh. you from. <laughs> right. Well, guess what? It's grown a little in your absence, so that's nice. Um, and some other books and stuff. Yeah, one thing uh, we wanted to structure it this way, so as you can see, we have sort of five different slides with three names. Um, and we'll do a little storytelling to explain the situations or where they got their names from. Um, but the idea of naming something or naming a behavior is really is really a helpful tool. Well, yeah, um, it's like Rumpelstiltskin, right? It's like Rumpelstiltskin. Yeah, once you, you name it. 
Yeah. yeah, you can call it out. You can explain it to other people. Um, the other thing that I really like about these is they're usually very humorous. And so something that may feel like a really um, sort of horrible thing that somebody's doing all of a sudden has a silly name like licking the cookie. Yes. So we'll start with bike shedding. Um, it's, it's like this is the starter one. This is the training wheels because so many yeah. people have heard of it. It's true. Um, if there is a nuclear power plant and someone suggests plans for it, then everyone else assumes, well, someone else, like a committee already looked at that. I'm just going to say okay to that. But if the plans also have an appendix saying, and in the parking lot of the nuclear power plant, there shall be a bike shed. And what color should the bike shed be? Uh, I believe the, the guy who wrote the original email that's at bikeshed.org said that, you know, the quantity of discussion of a change is an inverse proportion to its importance and complexity. Uh, and this was in response, I believe, to a thread about whether the sleep function should take, like, milliseconds or seconds <laughs> or something like that. And, you know, like, many, many emails had been generated. Um, and... If you have bike shedding, like we, I, Wikimedia, we totally have bike shedding in our organizational structure, uh, in in uh, in both you know the foundation and our you know stuff that the volunteers do, et cetera, et cetera. And one thing we'll do is we'll just say something like, "Let's bike shed about this for two hours and then move on," you know, or like, <laughs> "Let's bike shed about this on the mailing list, but then on Thursday, like, I'll be making a decision." Stuff like that. Like, if you kind of time box. The bike shedding. Uh, I heard about a meeting we had recently where at, when conversation kind of gotten off track, one person said, I don't think this is the bike shed we came here to paint. <laughs> <laughs> or where is that bike shed again? You know, <laughs> I think we've lost sight of the bike shed. So, um, you know, it is possible once you sort of spread awareness of what that is. And please feel free to speak up or raise your hand if you are like, oh my gosh, I have this perfect example of this that happened last week. Um, you know, jump in the discussion at any time. However, since we have 15 of these, we may need to take one per at most. All right, so we'll take yeah. one per. Anyone going to pick up bike shedding? No. All right, let's move on to yak shaving. So um, yak shaving is, is a fun one. The, the sort of uh, canonical parable of yak shaving <laughs> is um, you, you want to make some kind of baked good, and you choose a, a cake. Do cakes require milk? I don't bake enough. Yeah. Mostly. All right. Milk. Not if it's a vegan cake. Okay. Sure. Let's let's say that you're an omnivore and you are making a cake for omnivores. And uh, and you make a cake and you need some milk, which means you need to go to the store, but you're cold and none of your jackets is quite good enough. What you really want is a sweater. So you decide that you will make a sweater, but you don't have yarn. And so you go in the yard and you start shaving a yak to get the yarn to make the sweater so you can go out to the store so you can get milk. When you could have just made a vegan cake, or decided one of your jackets was good enough. Um, and the heart of this is concentrating on sort of optimal architecture for the system of solving the problem instead of just solving the problem in a way that's good enough right now. Because you know, shipping is a feature, right? If you forget that shipping is a feature and you start concentrating on building the perfect CMS for your website instead of just like making your website, um, then that is an example of yak shaving. Again, this is the kind of thing that a lot of people are prone to because we want to do things right. And it is difficult sometimes to be the person to say, what about right now instead of right? Uh, but if people are aware of the norm of yak shaving, and again, like kind of time box it and say, you know, we should give ourselves some time to do the yak shaving that we want to do and not balance too far in the other direction where everything's like this quick and dirty hack with duct tape. Because you shouldn't make sweaters out of duct tape either. It's true. They probably let cool in somewhere. Yeah. Um, all right. Anybody want to jump in on that one or say, actually, I've heard it explained this other way. Sure. Go. What's your name? Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. I am ashamed that I didn't mention that. What's your name? Hey, John. OK, from now on, we attribute that to John. Excellent. All right, John. John. Yeah, it's good. This is not how I know yak shaving at all. Oh, oh tell me how you know yak shaving. Yay. Uh, they have different in stories. In the Sizzadmin world. In the Sizzadmin world, OK. Um, Right. So, so like there's a necessary. A legitimate chain of dependencies or a procrastinating chain of dependencies that you've sort of made up because you don't really want to do the real thing. 
Yeah. Okay, so in the Sysadmin world, yak shaving is like following up and having to do the tedious work of a chain of dependencies of this depends on that package, which depends on that version of PHP, et cetera, et cetera, going, you know, begat, begat, begat. Um, and uh, sometimes it's necessary, but sometimes there is procrastinating yak shaving where you sort of are doing a bunch of dependencies instead of like doing the real work. I think you and then you. Hold on. There's a there's a seat right there. Distracted from uh, the, the actual focus of what you were trying to do, and you know, sort of saying, "Oh, wait, there's this other interesting sub problem, which has another <laughs> sub problem, and you know, eventually you just end up somewhere totally different from where you started out and what you were actually." Doing. What's your name? Kevin, thank you, Kevin. Um, yeah, the, if I may summarize, uh, the issue is partly that it is possible to use this as procrastinating by looking at like interesting subproblems where the end product would be slightly better, and you know, kind of going off in, into that digression. Um, I think uh, Heidi. Heidi. Yeah. Are you going to cover gold plating later, or are we going to use that as a subsystem of yak shaving? Why don't we talk about gold plating? What yeah, is gold let's plating? Talk about it. <laughs> gold plating. <laughs> people who forget that shipping is a feature, uh, senior senior people uh, who really want to do everything like the optimized and with brushed chrome. This guy and recreated Google search. This guy recreated Google search. For a catalog. For a, a catalog? Yeah. Was it a really awesome catalog? It really wasn't. It was, it was not. A slow mobile app catalog. Slow mobile app catalog. Wow. Yeah. The, like so many people are, are sort of spending their time on, on things in like the, the cave paintings, but like in a place where no one goes spelunking. Like, uh, <laughs> anyway, we should probably move on, huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the other thing though uh, that I thought I'd also just point out uh, after our discussion is that a lot of times there are, um, so we're, we're talking about these as examples of dysfunctions, but there's definitely versions of them that are totally normal and the right thing to do. And um, what you want to do for the goals of your particular project. So the example of yak shaving being a totally legitimate um, process versus admins was a good example of how you know somebody can be this far out or they can be sort of yak shaving just a little bit. Um, or it could be the behavior that you're actually looking for. Um, usually there tends to be this tension between people who want to do things right, people who want to do it now. Um, you're starting to see some of the commonalities um, that might, you might be able to pick up. So fear of missing out. Uh, is this idea that you really just need to gather more and more information in order to do what you're supposed to do. So everybody agrees that you want to complete this thing. Um, you may have to learn a little bit in order to do it. Uh, and your approach is, okay, I will go gather information. And they check back in, and you're still gathering information. And um, they check back in maybe a week later, and you're like, well, there's a few more things that I want to explore. So before um, my current job, I worked at EFF. And you can only imagine this was something that uh, struck every single new employee because we had a million of totally fascinating and philosophical and political discussions with really, really smart people. And so you would say, well, I know I'm supposed to do fundraising, which was my role. But in order to do that, I really, really do need to understand what's going on. So I'm going to go to every single meeting for every single team um, for the next three weeks. And it was really super fun. But at the end, I wasn't doing my job. So um, <laughs> I think that's a really good example of fear of missing out because you're like, but what if there's this one thing that somebody might ask me about? So I'll just go to this fun meeting and find out. So one way I think about this is in anything you're doing, any, any job, any activity, there needs to be a balance between execution and alignment, between you know, sort of creating the artifact that you are meant to create, creating the service you are meant to be doing, and you know, learning, and uh, communicating with your coworkers, and sharing best practices, and you know, making sure you're heading in the right direction during the execution phase and understanding how your piece fits into the larger whole. Exactly. And, like and so, I mean, one thing that we hate about bad meetings is that they take up too much time, and that's like alignment time, and you feel like there's a, a, an unbalance, right? Uh, an imbalance between the time you're spending on the, the execution and like a lot of time in alignment. Then on the other hand, people, like remote people, who don't really get a chance to uh, enjoy like the ambient information flow with the people in San Francisco, um, we 
experience the opposite problem of like we aren't getting enough alignment time to make sure that our execution is going well. Um, so fear of missing out, I think, is maybe something you experience when you haven't hit the balance of how much time you need to be spending on execution versus alignment. Yeah, that's it's really also something good. a lot of us experience when we're suddenly in really rich environments, I think. It's kind of like, oh, you, one sign you might be in an environment that's actually very good for you is all of a sudden you're like, wow, there's so much exciting stuff happening, and you actually feel an anxiety of like, I can like right now, Right now, I'm leading this session, so I can't go to the train the trainer session that sounds really awesome that I suggested. <laughs> um, I told the Open Hatch people, that's how you should run an open source bridge. They were like, great, and now it conflicts with this. So, ah, hoisted on my own petard. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, it, it, it it's an experience, it's like a sign of success, it's a problem of success. Mm. Um, but yeah, you'll run into other other people in your org maybe who have like fear of missing out and you can see that it's actually getting in their way mm -hmm. regarding getting their job done. Let's move to the next slide. We did. Oh, great. <laughs> Man, you're like, totally the, slide, on it. The, the slide is faster than the eye. Um, all right, Happy Path, do you want to talk about this? Uh, sure, so Happy Path is a situation when somebody who uh, takes responsibility for testing only tests the defaults. And they're like, oh, it's great. It works perfectly fine. Don't worry. I did all of the testing required. Um, so it's called the happy path, obviously, because they um, didn't test all of the sort of outliers or all of the use cases. Um, and, uh, and this happens no matter whether you're testing software or a workflow, such as what if a new person comes to your project? So one of the important things to regularly test is, if I were a random person, you know, maybe with such and such criteria, like I am web savvy, I know how to like write HTML, and I know how to send and receive email and use the web, and I want to, let's say, edit Wikipedia, like what steps would they have to go through, and what if they forgot their password? What if like they actually made a really minor error with the brackets? Like those are not the happy path, and we need to test those too. <laughs> Any questions? Any interruptions? Nope. So I, I, you probably run into this sometimes when uh, you're in an organization where they think that talking about problems that could occur uh, in the software or in the, like the social software and the workflow is somehow quote bad for morale. <laughs> I find yes, Heidi. And So Heidi just left this sort of Mordor of a company <laughs> where they wouldn't publish their release notes publicly or, by the way, I'm, I'm saying this on a video that's going to be recorded. You left and you told them why. All right, cool. <laughs> More power to you. Um, they wouldn't publish the like, notes about bug fixes or new features in the release notes because that might discourage the customers. Wow. Yeah. So that doesn't make you glad to work in open source. <laughs> Oh man, we'll like make the release notes full of bug fixes. <laughs> Actually, we, I think more people should, a complete side note on release notes. Dreamwidth does this awesome thing called a code tour where every, uh, Dreamwidth is a, a, a journaling service and it's an open source project. Denise there is one of the two leaders for it. Um, and every time they do a push, a deploy of new code, uh, someone goes through every single commit that's new, that's deployed, and explains what it does, and thanks the person who did it. Explains what it does for the layperson. For the lay person. For the, oh, I was gonna say that, yeah. Like, I did a code tour once, and I realized that I actually love, you know, that moment of like seeing, oh, here's the thing that it did, and here's how someone else will be able to understand it. You know, you give the context of the way the problem used to be, and then you say, but now there's a fix, and now things are better. It's kind of like the Amazing Grace model of, like, we once were lost, but now we're found, <laughs> uh, of, like, explaining to, you know, what, what a code fix or a new a feature did. Um, and it's a, it's a wonderful model. So one of the problems, I skipped ahead to um, the one with happy clappy and never say no, because these are two problems related to the happy path. Somebody may start following the happy path as a result of there not being a sort of safe space within your community to talk about problems or to talk about bugs. Um, and I think we had defined um, sort of happy clappy as exactly that. Like everything has to be contributing to a positive morale, otherwise we can't really talk about it and we'll just pretend it doesn't exist. And of course, I mean, there are ways to be totally dour and demoralizing and like all of us should only eat gruel. And, um, and that sucks too, we shouldn't do that either. But there are like legitimate constructive ways of bringing up criticism. 
And if you're in a situation where no one's been allowed to talk about cruises for a long time, when you finally open the release valve, some blockages are going to kind of come out and they'll be a bit gray and sooty. So, yes, Skylar. Actually, so um, in UX, that's probably the biggest role of UX is to kind of be the functional critic. Mm. Um, by using user voice, you can kind of take the user stress off the team from saying, did you look at this example? You can mm. say, A way to depersonalize this criticism is uh, uh, how a UX designer would create personas, and uh, including personas of other developers, maybe newbie developers or whatever, and say not, I think you're wrong, but like, how would such and such person, you know, in this persona react to this? And sort of do the, the Socratic questioning in like a, a non-jerky way, yeah. right? Yeah, so Skylar? Anyone can use user personas. Yeah. You, you, okay, you create this, yeah, the, the scarecrow. Um, you know, you, you put a picture of a person, you put some text under it, and anyone can I, do that. I think that's a fantastic idea of um, both using voice if your community didn't already have this and solving the problem by adding structure. So going back to the four different or five different, including goals, ways that we talked about, um, you know, your community might be made up. Um, that seems like a perfect way of depersonalizing it, um, helping people avoid the happy path by, cre you know, creating um, sort of a process by which it can... So I just realized we are already 15 minutes over schedule in the explain <gasps> section. So we may wish to, unfortunately, be extremely luxury on the next few slides. Yeah, super quick. We'll just <coughs> run through them. Right. Do you want to go with missing stare? Why not? All right. All right. So um, if you have visited a, a perhaps sort of lackadaisical friend's house and their staircase like a, re a reasonably important staircase has a missing stair. And they're like, oh yeah, you just like remember to walk around that. You're like, just fr fix the thing, fix the stair. If you have to warn every new person who comes in about a thing that like, oh, everyone knows around that, such as a problematic community member. Oh yeah, he's kind of a creep, but we all just ignore him. No! Freaking fix the missing stair. This, I believe this analogy comes from Cliff at uh, Provocracy. Uh, there was a, a blog post about the missing stare, and we were like, many of us were just like, yes, yes. <laughs> so that um, if if people are just sort of assuming that it's okay to like just tell every <laughs> single new person to deal with the problem ad hoc because it's somehow too much trouble to actually deal with it in a systematic community way, well, that sucks. Yeah, and the sun will come out tomorrow is an example, uh, or you can think of an example where somebody says, I know that I'm a week late. And I know that there's been problems that have delayed it. But even though I'm not going to change anything next week, it'll actually be fixed next week. Um, so this is the um, sort of strategy somebody might use or try to convince you or build your confidence that they'll actually finish something on time by saying, um, you know, uh, uh, even though, um, I'm trying to think of a particular example. Like, oh, yeah, I ran into some problems last week. And I ran into some problems a little bit before that. Yeah. And I ran as a problem. But, but so like, next week, it'll feel there will be no problem. Um, believing something will get better in the future without changing any of the variables that went into it. Indeed. Um, so film critic is a person in your community who might believe that their highest and best contribution is to criticize what other people are doing. Um, uh, an example of this is uh, the open source community I'm a part of uh, has a lot of new people. And um, we had, as a, in a kind of a community tune-up session, um, a group of new users who um, we were supposed to come up with a particular action that we were going to do and that we could contribute to the team. And the action that the group came up with was to um, provide feedback on documentation to be sure that it was understandable by people who are new in the community. So they didn't want to write the documentation, but they would provide feedback on it. Um, that's an example where they probably could actually better serve the community by helping write the documentation in a way that, that they could understand. Well, uh, another way of looking at this particular anti-pattern is that... It's someone who believes that their own success 
as a project member is actually disconnected from the success of the project as it is. Like you run it, uh, uh, useful feedback along the way, like at appropriate times is mm. great and useful, but like, oh, we are about to launch tomorrow. Now you give me the 2000 word spec that you, of like what you would have wanted. Um, now, like a, a, the reason I think the phrase film critic, which uh, the, the book by DeMarco uh, came up with is because when you think about a film critic, like the film critic isn't like helping make the movie better at the time it's being made, yeah. right? They, they think that their responsibility is like to some external audience and not to the teammates. So if, if you have a person where they're acting as though their individual success is actually divorced from the success of the project that you're all working on, it's kind of a film critic. Do you wanna go over Philip's head? Yeah, why not? So um, a demonstrably better idea is not immediately accepted by the group this, I mean, there's always some uh, reasonable inertia about changing over your infrastructure, but people who have like the not invented here syndrome uh, of, oh, well, you know, if we didn't make it, then, then we're not gonna use it. Um, p the communities that are too conservative, too set in their ways. Um, what, like, if you are sort of feeling like you're running to, into inexplicable frustration about changing the way things are done, one way to think about this is remember, the Phillips head is a superior way to screw and unscrew screws, right? But it's still like incredibly hard to get people to switch sometimes. Yeah. So founder syndrome uh, is a situation in which somebody leads by refusing to adapt as a project grows, uh, and especially by refusing to take criticism um, and collaborate. This can also manifest by being a micromanager, so they are used to taking care of or executing on a number of very low-level things, and they continue doing that despite the fact that what would actually be better for the project is if they do a better job delegating that to other people. And I think a lot of us have run into this. I mean, this is one especially that happens with nonprofits, sometimes for profits, open source organizations. Um, you know, there's a, a shelf life to every institution, and there's a shelf life to everyone's involvement in a particular institution. And staying past the expiration date of when you know, you're no longer thriving together. Instead of helping the organization achieve its goals, you're actually impeding it. Mm -hmm. And one of the great things about organizations or communities in general is that people can come in and out and you can kind of keep that energy level. Isn't that great about like freedom and autonomy and about the it's fact true. that we aren't like bound in serfs? <laughs> Forever to this one thing. Um, Sorry, am I, am I like speak for myself? Like what? <laughs> yeah. uh, so we already talked about happy clappy and never say no, those are the situations. Oh, sorry, hold on a second. Was, oh, there, yeah, sorry, sure. was there a comment? <laughs> Songs of Angry Men. Um, look, <laughs> uh, licking the Cookie uh, is the situation and the title of the talk where somebody, uh, as you can imagine, sort of a plate of cookies and somebody sitting around it licks one, doesn't eat it, and puts it back. So this is where somebody says, yes, I will do that thing, I will execute on that project, and it turns out they actually don't. So now they're not going to eat the cookie and now no one will either. So the, uh, I think you mentioned your manager does a lot of this, you know, basically saying, oh yeah, that's on my to-do list. Oh yeah, I got some ideas about that. Oh yeah, I've been thinking about doing that. Um, and we, as social creatures, we don't want to step on someone else's turf. We don't want to duplicate other people's work. But by sort of hoarding to-dos that a person's interested in, right? I mean, that's just... Uh, one, one thing that happens a lot, if, you, if your bug tracker has just sort of over time an increasing number of open tickets that get assigned to a particular person and then nothing else ever happens, so in, uh, actually one thing we're doing at the Wikimedia Foundation is every once in a while, our bug wrangler goes through and if something's been assigned to a particular person for a really long time and nothing's happened, de-assign. Like, I feel like, you know, you've been assigned to this for, I don't know, like 90 days and you haven't even made like a comment saying like, I'm working on this or anything, de-assign. And uh, part of this is just cultural about making people aware that cookie licking is a thing that happens so that I can say something like, hey, to avoid cookie licking, mm -hmm. let's make sure we have a specific plan about this or something like this. Um, so the word plan, unfortunately, to some people it actually means something much more tentative than others. And I think that's part of cookie licking is if someone says, I'm planning to, I'm <laughs> fixing to, I reckon I'll get around to it. Um, mm -hmm. I think, yeah, maybe more people should use I'm fixing to. I don't know, because it's, it's, it sounds less definite oh, less like than a plan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but one thing, so my partner, uh, 
got a little bit annoyed that in my family, uh, sometimes people would say the word plan, and it was a lot more tentative than what he was used to. So someone would say, oh yeah, I'm planning to come to New York on Friday. And then like two days later, it's like, well, the, the plan changed. So, you know, it's going to be Saturday now. <laughs> well, the plan changed. And so he said, well, you have not a plan, it's a plan. <laughs> a plan is a plan without commitment. A plan means you bought tickets. <laughs> And so uh, he came up with the word plin, which I now use liberally in my communities, and I urge you to use as well. A plin is a term for all that brainstorming and tentativeness and things that people say they're fixing to do, but there's no dates and there's no commitment. Like the, uh, I think the open source equivalent of buying tickets is to say publicly, like on a wiki page or on a mailing list or something, I am taking responsibility for this. I will send another update on date. I will be reviewing other people's code if you send me patches. I will be responsive in the bug or on this thread. Saying stuff like that with like dates and commitments and not just, oh, I have this idea that we should do it in MVC or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and actually saying the next step of what you're gonna be doing. That's a plan. Everything else is a plan, and I urge you to call it out as such. And, and say, well, it sounds like we're kind of planning about this. Who is going to step up and actually make a commitment? Because we need, I think, this is one that's a cultural norm that I guess this is like the one that I'm most interested in because I have a, a word for it, you know? And so, uh, like, I, the, the word that got made up is, is by someone I care about, so I want to spread that. Um, <laughs> And so if you have a chance, please call out uh, planning nicely and say, you know, there's a, there's a bit of uh, cookie licking here. Cool. So, oh, yes. Yeah, I had a question about that. Is that usually uh, like an organizational change that needs to happen in order to reduce that? It might very well be that if, if you have a lot of cookie licking around, it's because um, there's some culture uh, that's not about accountability. And so you might need to actually, for instance, set up some kind of lightweight quarterly review system or something like that. Or it sounds like you actually took the approach of both changing cultural norms by introducing the word plan and implementing a technical solution or a structural, pro like structural solution by um, de-assigning uh, oh, yes. bugs. Oh, yes, de-assigning bugs, right. Okay. Yeah, there's, it depends on what the, who it is who's doing it, if it's rampant, and whether they are maybe a manager or something. Um, so if it's someone who's in power, you know, the power above you, you know, it might be that... Uh, Asking for dates, like so, when are you going to get each of these done? So you know, and say it nicely, like so I can plan. Then again, it might be that you need to leave. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so we'll race through the last slides, and these you can kind of summarize by saying a mismatch between um, urgent and important, or some kind of dysfunction related to people confusing the two. Broken window is a uh, kind of a word taken from a paper in I think the late '60s or '70s um, about this idea that if there's a bro one broken window, there will be more broken windows. Um, and that sort of deferred maintenance. Um, I uh, experience this a lot in my house. I'm in a shared house. And if there's like one plate in the, dish, or in the sink, like there will inevitably by the end of the day be more. So it kind of shifts the cultural norms of a community um, along the lines of things that require regular maintenance. So you're deprioritizing maintenance. Um, code smell is a sort of something kind of like a broken window that suggests there's a larger problem in the community or there's a larger issue here. Often like a missing stare and a code smell might be sort of related. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, if you, if you happen to see people using particular uh, patterns you know, in, in their code or in how they relate to each other, sometimes that's a symptom. And do you want to finish up with adrenaline junkies? Sure, sure. Um, so uh, adrenaline junkies, confusing, urgent, and important tests. Uh, maybe we all have someone in our community who kind of wants to play the hero. And uh, so, you know, there, there's, as with all these things, right, these are sort of some useful names, some handles you can grab. I'm personally fine if other people sort of, you know, turn these into variant meanings uh, uh, for use in their communities. But uh, to me, an uh, adrenaline junkie situation is, um, ignoring important things in favor of urgent things. Yeah, I hear a lot of people saying, you know, I put out a lot of fires, and you might want to ask, like, well, were the fires important? Or who's starting those fires? Yeah. Maybe we should find the arsonists. <laughs> um, or, or have building codes. Yes. So the fires don't start. Indeed. 
fire extinguisher. And, in your and, bed. and smoky and all these. Okay, fire's done. Okay. Great. So now is the time when we get to stretch and move and discuss and talk about your own experiences with some of these things and brainstorm with people in the room about how you might be able to fix them. Um, so the way that we thought would be helpful to do that is. Um, kind of gather around and feel free to move seats. I think that's OK, right? Moving seats. You have to move chairs for yes, this. Yes, please move chairs um, into groups of four um, or six, um, probably somewhere between four and five would be optimal. And uh, try to, well, introduce yourself, say who you are, you know, maybe how you're feeling, um, and then try to assign a role of timekeeper. So this is somebody who will just set an alarm and say, you're talking for too long, um, because you don't want to spend more than two minutes sort of explaining your particular situation. A gatekeeper is um, refocusing somebody. the conversation on the, the discussion questions in case you kind of, you know, start bike shedding or something. A facilitator uh, to, to guide the conversation and make sure other people listen while one person speaks. Uh, the, often the facilitator and the gatekeeper end up kind of sharing that Being kind of stuff. And, and a reporter, this is pretty important, someone who will like, you know, write some stuff down to describe some of the insights, the problems and solutions uh, discussed by your yep. group. And share with all of us afterwards. And these are the kinds of questions or the ways that we thought it might be helpful to kind of break down what is the nature of your problem. Um, so what can't you do? What are you um, obstructed? Um, from doing uh, which strategy uh, do you plan on choosing or did you choose in the past? Maybe you want to reflect on um, some choices you made um, previously and a few sort of descriptions of your community culture to help uh, the rest of the team kind of brainstorm what solution might be realistic for you. Um, and then does your problem have a name? And uh, I just put all of the ones that we talked about on a long list. So we can either keep this slide up or we can flip back and forth every once in a while between the questions. Um, and the roles. And the, yeah, and the different but the questions, roles, and then the actual names of some of the ones that we covered. Right. Okay, uh, we probably don't have time right now to have like feedback about this, but uh, Kelly and I would be interested afterwards to be yeah. here to hear like what worked, what didn't work for you. And we're also going to ask some of the people who left, uh, like, okay, like what were you sensing that this wasn't going to be great for you? So um, about how, we had about four or five groups, right? Could I have the reporters raise their hands? One, two, three, four. Okay. Um, Amir, was there someone in your group? Okay, uh, maybe maybe one of you can sort of talk about stuff. Um, okay, uh, is there a slide that would be best to have as the background here? Okay, all right. So um, one of the reporters, whoever feels comfortable, maybe speaking a little bit first, coming up here with the mic. Okay, thank you, Ian. And this is this is recorded, I believe. Okay, so we, uh, we talked about a few things. I think right off the bat, we, we uh, discovered a couple new patterns or, or pattern names. Uh, one was skeletons in the closet, the idea that people don't want to volunteer on certain projects where they know there's a whole bunch of bad stuff in there. The flip side of that is shiny new project syndrome, and so they, that, you know, they, by the you know, same token, they also want to work on very new things. And uh, I think so through a lot of ours, uh, there was a common thread that uh, this is kind of the fundamental challenge of volunteerism, getting people to do things that they don't want to do while still volunteering. Um, yeah, I think we actually also covered a couple, a couple others, especially on long projects. There are a lot of things like specialization uh, that, that, that turn into things like film critic or fear of missing out. And, uh, and really in, uh, can, can often lead to some variations on uh, founder syndrome. Uh, a, a thought there was that there's a kind of figurehead problem. Sometimes the founders become less involved, even though they want to be involved in everything. And so the, some of the people who really know what's going on often struggle with uh, the, the, those folks having uh, too much involvement. So I think that covers uh, what we discussed. Um, hey, so thank you very much. Do you, did it feel like uh, you came up with any insights that might actually be helpful to, to anyone uh, solving their problem? Or was it maybe just good to vent? I like the venting. Okay, you like the venting. <laughs> All right, that's cool. Who would like to be next? Okay, thank you. Uh, one of the group members and I have left uh, bad situations very recently, and we talked about the differences between nailing jello to the wall, which is when management gets super over controlling and they just want to stop making software and start making metrics, and also the problem of a complete lack of direction, like wandering in the desert without ever releasing or feeling like you're accomplishing anything. 
And then we talked a little bit about um, irreplaceability and how if you are irreplaceable, you will never get promoted. And the dangers of building a code cocoon around yourself, not that you do it on purpose, but you just eat some leaves and one day you wake up and you're the only person who understands that code you wrote. A code cocoon. A code cocoon. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, is there anyone here who does not know what I mean when I say bus factor? Okay, great. Yeah, I know. I'm just trying to step away from extra micness because I put on the level here. Yeah, so um, the uh, bus factor is uh, the idea that what if one day one of the really important contributors on your project gets on a bus? Um, the less kind version is gets hit by a bus. Um, it used to be said in Linux circles, like, what if Linus Torvalds gets hit by a bus? Um, and we kind of know the answer now is, uh, okay, well, the Linux kernel would survive because there are certain like lieutenants who would step up and, and then lead the Linux project. Um, my partner wrote a humorous article called, like, what if Linus Torvalds gets hit by a bus in empirical study? Well, it was structured like a research report of, like, we took 20 Linus Torvalds and had them hit by buses <laughs> at varying velocities. <laughs> and the answer is that if he gets hit by a bus, like, he will probably be injured and die. He should probably be, it results, conclusions, he should be kept away from, like, being hit by buses. <laughs> um, but the actual answer is, if you have to ask that question, then you should be building more resilience and redundancy in your project. Pair programming is often, a pair programming and a habit of code review are important for this to make sure there's always like multiple people who can take over if someone you know gets sick has to go uh, deal with a family emergency or what have you but it's possible to accidentally build yourself into a code cocoon that sounds so comfortable and cozy i guess that's and you never want to leave and you never want to leave next reporter say that again a code shell a code shell ha Uh, we mostly came up with yeah, um, or uh, commiserated okay, and okay. identified some new uh, variations of these problems. Uh, there was a really good insight that cookie licking is often a way to avoid building a consensus. Like there's something that is work being worked on and this one person has some strong opinions and doesn't want to talk to people so they just pick up the whole thing and then uh, it's over. Uh, we talked about another type of issue that I don't think was named where there's some nasty code that no one wants to touch and one person touches it once and suddenly they're the domain expert and... Uh, oh, I see. It's like the tar pit. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like you step into the tar and all of a sudden like you're now forever tainted by being the parser expert. Right, yeah. <laughs> the bug of eternal stench. The bug of eternal stench. Oh, the bog of eternal stench. <laughs> Uh, we talked about yak shaving is um, sometimes inevitable. Like You are always solving problems that have been solved before, but finding the solution can be as much work or not, if not more, than just doing it your own stupid way, like way number 800. Um, there was some good insight about how to get help if you have a hard question. Like We talked about a hard question. People won't answer it sometimes, and someone suggested asking an easier question getting someone to help you, and then, then you spring your hard question on them. So wait, wait, there's like a bait and switch suggestion here? Yes, that, that term was used. Okay. Bait and catch? Bait and catch? <laughs> I hope it's going to be catch and release. I mean... <laughs> and we talked about um, loyalty, voice, and exit, um, and we, we discussed about if voice is actually a possible solution ever, um, and it was pointed out that software developers are often not the best people at communicating with one another, so uh, that's, a, that's an uphill battle for them. Well, this is one reason why, uh, uh, thank you, is that about it? The end. Thank you. Um, the, you make a really strong point that like, a lot of us didn't get into this because our core competency was dealing with other people in like a really subtle, nuanced, and empathetic way. Um, <laughs> um, and then again, some of us did get into it because our core competence was something about understanding people. Like we have designers, we have translators, we have managers, we have marketers, we have documenters. Um, and all of this, as, as James Basile mentioned yesterday in his keynote, like if we're actually going to be changing the world and giving people more freedom, more autonomy, and more control over their computing, then you know people are key to that. So. Um, 
and we're all going to be like growing. I, mean, I figure like sessions like this are part of like learning people skills, right? I mean, it's kind of like the glossary at the at the back of a book, maybe. Is thinking having having some structures and approaches for how to think about like people related uh, issues and problems, um, but also being super welcoming in your community to people who have the passion to participate but not the skill yet is part of how you get more social sysadmins into your community who will be able to you know help out with things like this. I figure. Um, oh, we have about five minutes left? Four now. Four now. OK. The next reporter? We could probably run a little bit over. Go ahead. Is it possible that I could just project from here? Sorry, the video. Uh, could you maybe see if the, 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 the wire could go this long, though? Well, it's just I have a kind of paralyzing fear of microphones. But um, I will try. <laughs> OK. So uh, we talked about. Uh, there being a fine line between loyalty and opting out, and that you might feel like you're choosing to go along with the culture, but you're starting to disengage from it. You're not really there. So there's, there's a fine line there. It's almost this, it feels the same when you're making that decision, but it might not be. Um, a lot of people also um, get to this place where they're not exiting, but they're in limbo because there's some external change that's about to happen. You know, something is going to change in the company. You're all, somebody new is coming in, somebody's leaving, and you think, I'll just wait this out, and you can be there for a very long time. Um, we liked the idea of expirations as a way of uh, getting around the licked cookie problem. Uh, I think that that's a really good idea. We talked about... Uh, to-do lists, and that uh, sometimes you don't lick the cookie, somebody licks it on your behalf and hands it to you. And that the problem with that <laughs> is that, uh, <laughs> and that the problem with that is that uh, the, world, the world has access to your to-do list, that people can, can hand you jobs, and that the, the real problem there is that uh, you should be the only person that can write to your to-do list. Um, which I think also is a good reason to be really on top of your to-do list because then you really know when you have to say, actually, that, that, that cookie is not one that I want to lick because I can't take it. Um, let's see. Yep, that's it. Great. Thank you very much. And, uh, I'm sorry about the, the microphone. Um, <laughs> I, I hope that it uh, did not attack you. Um, <laughs> yay! Um, what, what I, I talked with that group a tiny bit, and we talked about how never say no. It's, it's an individual problem and a community problem. If people don't actually focus on what are our goals, what are we trying to accomplish here, then you might like just not kind of be able to say no to people, to things, to opportunities. If you're doing really interesting stuff, you're going to have more opportunities than you can take advantage of. Mm -hmm. And if you never say no, then you aren't going to be able to get important things done. And if you have a world writable to-do list, <laughs> then uh, that's going to be very demoralizing for you. Uh, and we have one last section right in the back. Do you, do you want to report out on what you talked about? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think that's about all the time we have. Uh, go ahead. One thing I wanted to say and wrap up is uh, the idea of voice being really hard came up. And I just wanted to point out that the format or structure of this workshop was designed to help you f as like a model of how to deal with these problems. So very often, um, if there's one person saying, this isn't really working out for me, I've found it helpful to talk to my peers and say, are you also struggling with this? Do you also think this would be a good solution that our um, team would benefit from? And getting their input um, on whatever choice I choose, or even to just understand the nature of my problem, has been really, really, really helpful. It can be people at your um, work. It can be people in your open source community. It can even be friends and family totally outside of it. Does, were there any reporters that we didn't hit? OK. Um, let's go to the sources slide. Yes. Oh, just kidding. I went right past it. Wow, you really hate citations. <laughs> um, maybe I can try going backwards. This is exciting. Can you go backwards? Will it let you me? can't step in the straight, same stream twice. <laughs> you can't step in the same stream twice. <laughs> so uh, most of the time, like these kinds of slideshow problems happen at the beginning of the talk, but we add that extra value of making it dessert. <laughs> so yeah, we have uh, a couple of, uh, or three actually, um, okay. places that we got a lot of this stuff. This is an intro, uh, you know, some stuff off the top of our heads and stuff from these works. If you are interested in how people work together in organizations, then these are just like three of the many, many. Uh, places you could look for help on that. Um, and 
uh, Kelly and I are both happy to talk about all this stuff while we're here at the conference and uh, hope that you enjoy these uh, lenses and find them useful in your uh, communities. And at the moment, we're looking for film critics. So if you have something to provide us uh, <laughs> on feedback with the presentation, let us know. Thank you. <laughs>